Croissonol. Welcome back to our channel, Coral Jacks, where we've recently been exploring ancient sites around Wales and sharing the history and folklore surrounding them. This week, we take a closer look at one of the nation's most impressive cromlech, known as Tinkinswood Burial Chamber, or Shamba Gladi Tinkinswood. It's estimated to be at least 6,000 years old, and its huge capstone is arguably the largest in Britain and perhaps all of Europe. It's been great fun making these videos, and we'd like to start this one off with a quick but massive thank you for all the support through our first year. Stay tuned for much more in 2024. We'll be packing up the dog, bikes and van to go exploring further afield. So let us know where you think we should visit. Tinkinswood is an awe-inspiring site, time after time. Five months ago, we made a short video about our visit, but over Christmas, we were back in the Vale of Glamorgan and armed with more research, a better knowledge of our camera settings, and access to aerial shots, we decided to revisit this amazing Neolithic site and take a better look. This megalith is in the small village of St. Nicholas, just seven miles from Cardiff city centre. A small car park offers a short walk through the fields on a public footpath. It's a popular site and also part of the Vale Trail, number seven, the Haunted Field Walk. A circular walk passing Dovrin Gardens, Tinkinswood, and the Cromlech at St. Lithens. Like a lot of the ancient sites that we visit, this one goes by many names. Castle Carrig, Stone Castle, Mysophiliast, Clecophiliast, and Gualophiliast. If you're interested into a deep dive into the theories and folklore behind the name Gualophiliast, or the Lair of the Greyhound, you should check out our St. Lithens video, where we go into detail and visualize the stories. But today, we'll simply be referring to this site as Tinkinswood. Dolmens, or Cromlech, are the most common megalithic structures across Europe. Tinkinswood is classified as being in the Seven Cotswold type, a concept coined by archaeologist Glyn Daniel in 1937, representing a regional group of long barrows, a broader architectural tradition found across Atlantic Europe, thought to stretch from southeast Spain up to southern Sweden and including the British Isles to the west. The Seven Cotswold tomb type is found primarily in the Cotswold regions of England and around the River Severn, stretching as far as Gower and Avebury, with some isolated examples in North Wales such as Capel Garman. We've covered one of these types of site, the giant's grave at Parc de Brios in Swansea, in a previous video, and as you can see from above, they have a strikingly similar outline. This shape is further described in a book called The Orientations of Neolithic Chambered Tombs in Glamorgan and Gwent Counties by Martin J. Powell. He says, The chambered long cairns that are the subject of this study form the western extremity of a class of Neolithic chambered tomb referred to as the Cotswold Seven Group. They are typified by their relatively small chambers set within a long trapezoidal or oval-shaped cairn, one end from which opens a cusp-shaped forecourt defined by two protrusions, or horns. The chambers may be set either terminally, immediately behind the forecourt, or laterally, opening from the sides of the cairn. The tombs are thought to have been constructed during the early to middle Neolithic period in Britain, i.e. throughout the fourth millennium BC. Few have been thoroughly excavated, and the poor condition of many of those remaining often prohibits a definitive assessment of their original form. Most have now lost their covering cairns, and the only visible feature is the chamber proper. Many people now theorize that these structures weren't necessarily all burial chambers, but that is still how they are officially classified, as tombs or burial chambers. With the seven Cotswold type in particular being thought to be used for communal burials, and excavations at sites such as this revealing both skeletal remains and cremation deposits, Tinkinswood was excavated in the early 1900s as well as in more modern times, so what exactly was found? Although not a fully-fledged excavation, a very early reference to Tinkinswood is during a meeting of the Cambrian Archaeological Association at Cardiff in 1849, which included a visit to what they call our Aboriginal and Druidical remains, the Cromlechs of St. Nicholas. During this visit, although not stated, it's evident that a small amount of digging took place and parts of human remains, including a jawbone, were found with one of the teeth said to be in good preservation. In 1914, 
antiquarian John Ward undertook an extensive programme of excavation in which the whole monument was excavated and portions of the dry stone walling in the forecourt were reconstructed, indicated by the differing herringbone style. The massive capstone also had a significant crack, so a support pillar was added. John Ward's excavations revealed the remains of 50 people. Sherds of coarse, round-based pottery, sherds of beaker pottery, and an assemblage of animal bones. The latest programme of dating human bone from Tinkinswood, carried out by Cardiff University, has revealed that deposition was occurring around 3700 BC, which is relatively early in the sequence of chambered tomb construction and use in South West Wales. A quote from TNF Online says, it is thought that Ward's discoveries, both within the chamber and below the monument, suggest that it was in use for a prolonged period of time, from the early Neolithic, as evidenced by the leaf-shaped arrowhead found on the old ground surface, and the dates from the bones, to around 2500 BC, as indicated by the recovery of beaker pottery from the chamber. The characteristic architecture of Tinkinswood, a Cotswold 7 style, suggests that people would have repeatedly visited the site. The bones of the buried people were not just kept in the tombs, but probably brought out into the light of day and perhaps used in ceremonies. Some believe this explains why skeletons were incomplete. In this sense, chambered tombs like Tinkinswood may have been the setting for rituals and performances involving the living as well as the dead. In 1939, two possible additional tomb sites close to the chambered tomb were identified. These included various piles of stone similar to the material used for the large capstone, arranged in a way that suggested human activity and looked very much like collapsed burial chambers. Similarly, the area of woodland containing a mudstone outcrop, located 100 metres to the east of the Neolithic monument, has been identified as the possible source for the Tinkinswood capstone and is also a scheduled ancient monument. A lot of this info can be found in Archaeologia Combrensis from 1900, including a long detailed report on Tinkinswood and all its previous excavations and writings. Links in the description. It also has this photo from 1914, and this, the earliest known etching. But what about in more recent times? In 2011, a team of archaeologists excavated fields surrounding the monument. According to a post on Glamorganshire History and Archaeology, it was suspected that there might be a second Neolithic barrow with a collapsed chamber in this field. The mound turned out to be a small Bronze Age barrow. Pottery and flint were discovered as well as a Roman coin. A short distance away is a small clearing in the middle of a large number of stones. This was suspected of being a quarry and possible site for the production of the stones used in the long barrow. A number of test pits were excavated but were generally inconclusive. During this project, the Cromlech at St Lithens was also excavated for the first time and fragments of human bone were recovered around the vicinity of the entrance chamber. These were thought to have originally come from inside the chamber. Evidence of a dry stone wall facade were discovered in the forecourt, along with small finds of Neolithic pottery, flint and bone. The impressive capstone measures 24 feet by 14. The impressive length, allowing the creation of the huge chamber, is what makes it arguably the largest capstone in Britain. But if judged by weight, its estimated 40 tonnes is easily beaten by the Browns Hill Dolmen in Ireland, estimated at 100 tonnes, although some reports claim it could be as much as 150. Theories of the original use of these sites can generally be categorised as burial, ritual or both. We've read many suggestions that earth mounds such as these were intended to represent the earth goddess, with the chamber itself representing a womb. Could this Cotswold 7 type shape be linked to why these sites are often referred to as a womb of Caridwen. We touch on this idea in our Pentriofan video and we'll go into much more detail in a future video, so please do subscribe to get notified of that. And of course, Tinkinswood is no stranger to legends and folklore. This part of Wales is actually known for its frequent ghostly encounters. As we mentioned earlier in the video, there's a haunted walk that takes you through the area. In the book, British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, fairy mythology, legends and traditions, written in 1880 by Wirt Sites. The author mentions Tinkinswood in his chapter of Ancient Stones and says the estate on which the Cromlech lies is haunted. Even more than the others, these solemn rocks are surrounded with legends of enchantment. 
They figure in many fairy tales, like that of a shepherd of Freni Vaur, who stood watching their mad revelry around the old Cromlech, where they were dancing, making music on the harp, and chasing their companions in hilarious sort. That the fairies protect the Cromlechs with special care, as they also do the Logans and others, is a belief the Welsh peasants share with the superstitious in many lands. There is a remarkable Cromlech near the hamlet of St Nicholas, Glamorganshire, on the estate of the family, whose house has the honour of being haunted by the ghost of an admiral. This Cromlech is called by the children in that neighbourhood, Castle Corrig. In our last video, we mentioned that the author goes on to say, a Cardiff gentleman who asked some children who were playing round the Cromlech what they termed it, was struck by the name, which recalled to him the Breton fairies thus designated. The Correds and Corregs of Brittany closely resemble the Welsh fairies in numberless details. The Correds are supposed to live in the Cromlechs, of which they are believed to have been the builders. They dance around them at night and woe betide the unhappy peasant who joins them in their rounds. However, a comment on one of our Facebook posts about Tinkinswood makes a good argument for why this could be another case of mistranslation. We love hearing your thoughts, theories and interpretations, so please do let us know what you think. Another early mention of Tinkinswood can be found in the book From Snowdon to the Sea, written by Marie Trevelyan and published in 1893. Embowered in woodland is the Vale of Worship, dotted here and there by hoary and moss-grown druidical stones, beyond which stands the largest cromlech in all Britain. Looking from the high moorland, the surrounding country appeared like a fairy realm stretching towards the region of the setting sun. The author goes on to tell the rather long story of Roger Meyrick's ride, a folk story of Castle Carrick, in which Roger finds himself riding about the area on a bewitched horse. It's a lengthy tale, so we'll put the link in the description if you'd like to read it for yourself. Marie Trevelyan also talks of Tinkinswood in Folklore and Folk Stories of Wales, 1909. She describes how the site is haunted by the spirits of druids. One victim said that they beat him first, then whirled him up into the sky, from which he looked down and saw the moon and stars thousands of miles below him. They held him suspended by his hair in the mid-heaven until the first peep of day, and then let him drop down to the Doverin woods, where he was found in a great oak by farm labourers. The group of boulders to the south of the monument is said to be women turned to stone for dancing on the Sabbath, a common theme in the folklore surrounding megaliths, just like the Merry Maidens in Cornwall. It's also said that anyone who sleeps within the dolmen on a spirit night would suffer one of the following calamities. He would either die, go raving mad, or become a poet. This is a very common old legend that you may have heard us mention a few times now, but we recently found an interesting article about the history of this fable and how tales of poet stones have spread over time. An interesting topic in itself, and lengthy enough for a video of its own. So for now, we'd like to thank all of you who are still watching till the end, and ask you to leave a question that we'll answer in our next video. We started this channel last year, so at the beginning of 2024, seems a great time to do a little channel update. Our channel's just passed the checks for YouTube partnership, and we're in the process of making an update slash Q&A video, so please do leave any questions that you'd like to ask us in the comments down below, and we'll see you next time.